you know, it progressed into some gorgeous swelling and pretty colors of purple and, you know, dark blue. And, um, but the thing that just resonated with me was you don't even recognize the foot hitting the ground. All you remember, the next thing is you're looking up at the stars. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Gate Guys Podcast. Sean Allen here. We're going to be on the line with Ivo in just a moment. There's a little excerpt from our podcast today, something to kind of pique your interest. We've got um, some interesting topics today, and we're going to be going over kind of the neurophysiologic processes of gait. Um, we're going to go through a personal injury of what you just heard a slight intro of, of uh, an injury that I sustained very recently. And... Um, you know, it's always neat as a clinician to have an injury and to have to go through the uh, the process, not only of experiencing the injury, but through the initial stages of the acute damage, the acute healing, and then the neurophysiologic changes that occur as the tissue heals and then as you go through your own rehab. And, uh, you know, thankfully injuries don't occur too often, but every once in a while they do occur even to clinicians and we are reminded of what it's like to be on the other side as a patient. And uh, I think it's a good thing. It's certainly not a welcome thing, but I do think it's a good thing. And uh, I made particular attention of this one. Um, nothing serious, but um, it was it was definitely an eye opener as to oh, that's right, I forgot what this is like. So um, it's been several years uh, since an injury occurred, and this was uh, again, as I said, a welcome yet unwelcome um, adventure. So we talk about that today. We've also got some other neurophysiologic principles. We go over some knee patellar tracking issues, some more on isometrics and tendinopathies, and then we finish up with running form and our thoughts on making changes to someone's running form or not. And we like to uh, think that we make a pretty good case for it. But um, you certainly are open to your own opinions on this, and many people have theirs, uh, founded or unfounded. Uh, but that's what makes this always a great debate. So let's just jump right into the podcast, and we will get rolling here. And we're back, Podcast 130, Sean Allen here in Chicago. I have on the line my good buddy and partner in the Gate Guys, Dr. Ivor Whalop. We've got a, another good show lined up for you today. We're going to kind of wing it a little bit, but we have a little bit of a kind of a rough itinerary. Some neat topics have come up in recent past and um, uh, thought it was worthy of bringing some of these things up. But you put up a, uh, a little flip-flop study and... Uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and just take the uh, the mic on this one, and then we'll we'll go into at least a case. And I am the case this week, folks. So um, uh, you're we'll a case, what... dude. But that's I another story. I'm <laughs> definitely a case. There's no question there. <laughs> I felt like a case all week. So uh, uh, um, first of all, I have to tell you, I'm extremely excited, and this has nothing to do with the Gate Guys, but G3 Tour, which is you know Joe Satriani with other people, um, is coming to Denver, and I got tickets. Uh, third row mezzanine and I'm taking my 10 year old son because he keeps asking me dad when's Joe coming to town when, dad when's Joe coming to town so uh, it should be a pretty cool show it's not till January but I'm very excited he's playing with one of my favorite guitarists John Petrucci and then he's also playing with the lead guitarist of Def Leppard so this is if for those of you out there that are listening this is a guitar fest basically it's totally indulgent um you know, electric guitars, shredding madness for um, anywhere from two to four hours. They just come out, each one plays a set, and then they come out and play a set together. But I am so excited. And uh, my son, he doesn't know yet, but will be very excited as well because he's never been to a, a Joe show. So should be good. But anyway, that uh, has nothing excellent. to do with uh, today's what? post that we put oh, up. Oh, you're, start, you're, you're starting your kids <laughs> off on the right uh, foot, that's for sure. Um, you know, it's better than... Um better than well i could think of a thousand alternatives that you could take them to in terms of music that would be a, a really oh. bad first step so um but uh, a little bit of a uh, virtuoso uh, hard rock uh, guitar playing would be a good place to start so let us know how it goes talk flip-flops well it will and just an oh, interesting good. aside mm -hmm. when lisa was pregnant with vander we went to the g3 show and um, it, of course, was, you know, Joe. And at the time, um, I forget who else was playing with him. But that was the first guitarist he ever heard So mm. uh, in the womb. So maybe that's why he likes it. Maybe it's in his DNA. I don't know. You never know how that stuff works, man. You got to <laughs> wonder. You really have to wonder. I mean, 
you know, the uh, a lot of things happen in that time. Whatever the mom puts in her body and whatever she's exposed to from medications, and they're talking about antibiotics now, uh, can lead to some of these gut problems even in the child um, if the mother is on stuff and if the mother isn't well. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I hate to think what my mom was listening to, uh, which has resulted in me growing up the way I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, I think it might have been Neil Diamond, actually, so that would answer a lot of things. <laughs> oh, man. So anyway, in the August 2017 issue of Lower Extremity Review, one of our favorite journals on the whole planet, which is totally free, um, you can just log on online, you can get the electronic or the print version sent to you. Anyway, there was an article in there that made me think of, and I don't remember how many years ago, you probably did, when we were speaking at National and um, you said, oh, come on out. Let's just talk for a couple hours and, you know, we'll do some fun stuff. And I think we were filming um, and doing some video stuff. So I had no idea what I was going to be talking about. So I was sitting in the airport um, waiting for my plane and I'm watching people walk by. And I'm watching people in flip-flops. I'm like, wow, their gait's really different when they walk in flip-flops. So I started um, – I took my camera out because that's what I do. And I just started filming everybody's uh, gait, and then I started thinking about it on the plane. And one of the biggest observations is, one, this decreased stride length that people have when they wear flip-flops. Two, the fact that they have to fire their flexors, um, which is going to reciprocally inhibit their extensors of their foot. And three, they lose ankle rocker. And as you remember, that was what became my entire talk (laughs) when I was in Chicago, because I had no idea what I was going to talk about for uh, however long we talked. But Lower Extremity Review this month... Um, did a nice uh, reference-based article talking all about uh, flip-flops. And it's called Flip-Flops Biomechanical Critiques Resonate with Clinicians and Designers. And they they talked about those regular old flimsy flip-flops that we see around as well as the new designer like it has an arch and a deeper heel cup kind of flip-flop and talked about um, some of the clinical concerns. And we outlined them today. But, you know, the big ones are, number one, you lose ankle rocker. And we know all about that. If you've been listening to the gate guys for any length of time, you know that uh, loss of ankle rocker is a lot of problems, Uh, possibly the scourge of humanity and um, maybe part of the reason that wars are fought in other countries. But we won't go there at this point. But suffice it to say, we lose ankle rocker. We shorten step length. We uh, um, actually increase the amount of um, dorsiflexion of the ankle, but only during swing phase, not during uh, stance phase. We actually decrease that and increase our plantar flexion ankle at um, at uh, stance phase. Um, and you're going to change um, contact times as well as uh, metatarsal pressures and things like that. So it was just a nice article, and it's always nice to see confirmation of what you are talking about. You know, when we talked about this, I would have to say, what was it, three, four months later, the Harvard study came out looking at uh, flip-flops, mm-hmm. saying pretty much the same thing that we said um, on that particular presentation. So anyway, um, I put it up this morning. It is September 29th. It already has a lots and lots of hits and action um, on it. It's a really easy article to read. It'll take you all of about 10 minutes to read through it. Some of the references um, are really good, and a few of the studies that they cited I was not familiar with. Um, one interesting aside, and maybe I can get your commentary from an orthopedic standpoint. I can certainly give mine from a neurological standpoint. Um, they talked about flip-flops as being good therapy for people with knee osteoarthritis because it um, changes knee um, external adduction moments. And um, because of the increased flexor activity, my guess is you're going to decrease um, patellar loading because you're doing more of a forefoot strike. Um, when you're doing that. But anyway, what's your take on on that as far as... Uh, I, I, one, I have to say, I've never prescribed flip-flops for anything in my office. We shred them. Um, but um, what is your what is your take on that? Um, I don't know. I guess I haven't thought about that. I, I used to take them away, though, uh, on a kind of a side note. I used to take them away, but I have I've realized that with the young girls, uh, at least here in the Midwest taking away their orthotics almost equates to taking away a cell phone. Um, they've got them in every color and they've got certain leggings and jeans that they wear that. So I realized that that was a bit of a futile, uh, thing. So what I did encourage, um, was okay. Whenever the flip flops blow out on the medial side, cause a lot of these girls do blow out through the medial side of it and the foam gets compressed down or they tend to hammer really hard through the big toe and it gets blown out on the inside so the medial tripod gets a little bit more uh, accentuated 
so I, I you know I encourage the parents look if you're going to encourage this bad behavior um, I'm going to encourage you to refresh these things on a regular basis now I know that um, I was told that um, Old Navy which is a store here in the Midwest. I'm not sure if they're nationwide or not. They probably are, but uh, I think they, they sell them at the beginning of the summer for three ninety nine or something a pair. So um, it's not a, a an expense. But so what I learned was is that taking them away uh, was was really only me with fighting words that never came true. So I, I made a deal with each one of these these people and and the adults too. I let you wear these, but this needs to be homework. You need to be very aware of toe extension and you need to be very aware of and you, you go through all the mechanics and, and ankle rocker and ankle dorsiflexion so that they would realize that when they were doing things right how much the actual flip-flop was it was inhibiting you know natural mechanics you know and then I encourage them look this is not something you stroll through the mall in or go on an architectural tour in downtown Chicago with these are for running out to take out the garbage to water the, the flowers to run to the grocery store for two minutes not to peruse every aisle but just to get a you know some eggs and milk or whatever so they're they're you know they were designed for pools and showering and locker rooms they weren't meant for you know what they have become which is a social statement if you will I don't know if that's the right to word but um but I, so i don't really I, I guess i need to think about the biomechanical thing but you did mention something about this study did you say that it you said something about it being lost in stance but not in swing or was it vice versa what, what did you say again you're going to get more dorsiflexion in swing face so in other words you got to hold right. the flip-flop on and create yeah, clearance exactly um yeah. so you get more dorsiflexion in swing face but in stance phase you actually have increased plantar flexion yeah yeah, and I would imagine, I guess, thinking about it, you know, the the we know that this thing stays on in the swing phase, as you said, through gripping of the toes down when in swing phase the toes should be up, and that's why they don't stay on. So I would assume that's why they have to dorsiflex the ankle more. Um, and then as soon as that foot's approximating the ground, they may go into a little bit of toe extension maybe, so they've got to actually plantar flex quickly to get the, the flip-flop to the ground so that it doesn't slide. I mean, one of the problems we do see is that people don't, typically square the heel up on the flip-flop and we see this a lot a lot of people slip off the medial side of the flip-flop and you know there's half of the flip-flop that's not even weight bearing uh, showing any weight bearing on it so I, i'm assuming that it's maybe a positional thing in trying to target the flip-flop to the ground and the foot shortly thereafter um, i need to think about it a little bit more but my my, my first knee-jerk reaction is that I just was curious. I mean, I was kind of surprised to see that. And I was like, because I've always been so dead set against flip flops, you know. Sure, I mean, me we've too. been known to take them away from people, shred them, you know, grind them down to nothing. I mean, that kind of stuff right in the office. But um, I have to agree with you. I've softened a little bit in my older age <laughs> um, yeah, the, um, as far as that. And I've actually, you know, now we, we, we talk about it more, but we always try to reeducate people on mm-hmm. how to uh, how to walk in them. Like, all right, you can wear flip flops, but you can't. You can't flex your toes. You got to hold your toes up, and we kind of yeah. go through. Well, and that, um, and that, as that we know, stuff. that causes the thing to st- it, it. It kind of, you know, it leaves the flip flop in the swing phase like a pendulum. It just kind of flutters in the wind. So I do think that the flexion is what keeps the foot over top of that thing because there's no strap in the back, and that's something you and I have always talked about. Is that it's why shoes work because there's a, a heel counter that holds the heel. So I don't have no problem with sandals as long as I got a strap, but. Uh, you had mentioned that they had talked about some of these other things like Birkenstocks or, or um, you know, the, the Nayots and, and whatnot that maybe have a little bit more of a footbed in there. Did they say that they were any better? I wouldn't imagine it was the case. No, no, no better. Yeah. yeah. One when thing I, I have expected to be. Yeah. One thing I have noticed is that any, any kind of a sandal that does come across the top of the foot really uh, make it high into the, the, across the top of the arch that really holds the foot to it. Um, do, they do better, you know, a lot of women's, um, like mules, like a shoe with a, that you really slide in. And the only thing that's open is just the heel. They tend to stay on a little bit better. So there's not quite so much gripping that's necessary. However, you still have to dorsiflex in order to keep the thing on your foot. Otherwise you're going to launch it into the air. So, um, and running in them, forget about it. So anybody who's running flip flops knows that, that issue. So, um, right. So, yep. Good stuff. Anyway, I was just, uh, I thought that was pretty good, and uh, people evidently think it's pretty good too because, um, you know, there's, flip-flops can be a kind of controversial sort of subject, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, there's, you know, we're north of 
five figures on that post right now so it's it's definitely a hit so um so last week we're now eight days nine days post i was um wednesdays i sh i work a little bit i start a little bit later in the morning i usually start at seven i think it was a nine o'clock start and we've had a terrible dry spell here so i was running out to water um some uh, flowers out front and um, i have a little mulch pile right outside off the the porch there that i'm trying to reconstruct a garden here and it was maybe only a mulch pile was about a foot foot and a half high and i have been for weeks just stepping on the mulch pile on my way to the hose to you know turn on the water well i happened to not to hit the top of the mulch pile with my right foot this day i hit the side of the mulch pile and the next thing i know i am kind of a <laughs> funny story um i was i was i was on the ground and obviously just pain just cranking through the brain through the leg and um i did a, a real nice um martial arts role uh, my professor would be very proud of me here and um you know i'm rolling on the lawn and an old man comes around the corner he's like Are you okay and i said no i just thought i was on fire okay i'd lived there a little bit but um i rolled a couple times and i remember standing up and the pain was just horrible and of course i'm in ankle dorsiflexion knee flexion and hip flexion not wanting to put the foot on the ground and um, one of the better sprains I've had, and it is nine, now nine days, and it's, I always say this, it's always good to be patient once in a while to remind yourself of certain things that your patients go through, because we tend to forget what real pain is and um, what an ankle sprain feels like if it's been a couple years. And uh, this was a doozy. I, you know, pretty sure a grade two blowout of the anterior talofib and the, and the, the, the um, most of the lateral mechanism, not the um, the posterior talofib, but uh, the calcaneal fib. And I inverted it so badly that I've had a lot of medial ankle pain. And I thought, well, it couldn't be a deltoid sprain. So I'm down there and I'm like, wow, I inverted that ankle so badly that I slammed the um, part of the talus, probably the sustentaculum area, up into the medial malleolus and pinched the t uh, tib posterior so it was a grand sprain even some pain across the taylor dome so god let's hope there's not a osteochondral defect there you know it progressed into some gorgeous swelling and pretty colors of purple and you know dark blue and um but the thing that just resonated with me was you don't even recognize the foot hitting the ground all you remember the next thing is you're looking up at the stars and it's just amazing to me because there is an option and we've all done that where you kind of invert the ankle and you maintain a standing position and um, now part of this was probably the mulch pile but you know I, I'm a real ankle sprain expert and I've done numerous where on flat ground I managed to sprain my ankle over you know a blade of grass and uh, you, you you still fall to the ground and I guess I was just shocked at the, and, and this is where I'd love you to chime in, would be the, the, the inhibition of the extensors of the body to hold me in the upright plane. I mean, it's like someone hit a switch even before I thought about it. And I was just, I remember thinking, of course, sitting on the grass going, wow, that was, that was so fast I didn't even recognize it. I just realized I was on the ground. And um, is that just all extensor inhibition right away? Just whenever you injure protective. a joint, whenever you injure a joint or sometimes if you injure a ligament, what's going to happen is you're going to get what's called arthrogenic inhibition. So whatever muscles and cross that joint are going to pretty automatically be inhibited. And that refers back, Illies and Stokes, I think were the first person to talk about that in the late 90s. And then it's been shown on and on again. And then there were a series of studies that showed after that where if a joint is swollen, you're going to inhibit the muscles which cross that. So I think because the nervous system acts so quickly, you know, you're talking like 150 milliseconds for an action potential to fire, um, you're going to um, you're, you're going to get that inhibition of the area. So now you don't have anything to kind of you know hold you up, or literally you don't have a leg to stand on um, anymore. And that's probably what what creates the problem. I mean, does it extend into, I mean, obviously quadriceps and glute inhibition, which are, you know, knee extensors and hip extensors, which keep you upright in the gravitational plane. I mean, you know, we've talked about this before where you step on a, you know, something sharp on the beach and immediately you go into that, you know, 
flexor withdrawal response. But in this case, it was, you know, not so much flexor withdrawal. It was just extensor, you know, inhibition or shutdown, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not just an ankle response. It was a knee hip. I mean, it was clear I, I inhibited that whole right side. My brain was not going to have any loading on that side, despite the ankle being the only traumatized part. Right. Well, you're going to get disaffrontation to your whole proprioceptive system on that. And your proprioceptive system, you know, particular vestibular spinal pathways, but there's other ones. That's what drives all your extensors, you know. So when you get a large response like you did as far as you know you had a pretty serious sprain it wasn't like just a little boink um over the area that's gonna take its toll um you know pretty quickly and i imagine different people depending upon what kind of shape you're in and all that other stuff are going to have different response times and stuff but no it's not unusual for that kind of stuff to happen or somebody to injure something and then they just crumple you know we see it all the time on the the ski hill and with mountain bikers and stuff like that they just like you know Totally, it just the set, the mechanism just fails. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, it, you know, the, the longer I'm in this this business, the more you start to pay attention to the fine details of things. And it's been a long time since I had a, a real doozy of a sprain like that or, or lower limb injury. But it's been interesting, even up until just this week, um, even a noticeable kind of dialing back of the whole limb in terms of postural response. You know, I can tell that the glutes just a little bit. Um, sluggish the quadriceps a little sluggish there's just a hint of a, of a of a limp still there but no pain anymore but you know i can tell that the thing isn't just really plugged back in yet uh, even though i've started into some some stability rehab stuff to try and get this thing more loaded again so um, i was in jujitsu today and even then noticing trying to you know do some just postural you know, positioning loads is, is, and, and it's only been nine, 10 days. So I'm being smart with it, but, you know, just kind of playing with it to experience where I am at 10 days, just to remind myself what clients are going through without putting myself in too much jeopardy. But it was just interesting to notice that still the glute is not fully willing to participate because, you know, it doesn't see a good ankle rocker because I'm still blocked out of that. So, you know, how are you going to get the glute on if you can't get into full ankle dorsiflexion? So, so into the classic slightly turned out foot and a little bit of a limp pitching off that right side onto the left a little bit. Hey, that left knee though earlier in the week was a little tweaky. Oh, that's right, because I'm loading the quadriceps. And it's just, you know, all the things we've written about here, but it's nice to be a, a student of the game sometimes, not just a teacher. So not my choice, but um, it did happen. So it's nice to, oh, yeah, yeah, this is all the stuff we talk about. So, Yep. Um, you know, acupuncture could help that. Yeah, I probably should stick some needles in it, and uh, maybe I'll get some points from you because I've got some needles here at the house. So um, now I'm willing to experiment on myself, not patience yet, but uh, it's because I need to get out and take some needling classes from you. So I'll get some well, some, uh, point, some it, points from you. Could be a good thing, you know, as yeah, far absolutely. as uh, just expediting the healing process. You know, we talk about all of the studies that we've cited through the time about acupuncture and dry needling to some extent. Um, and chronic ankle instability, you know, so, um, resetting, if that's actually what we're doing, you know, that spindle gain or increasing, you know, cortical, um, inhibition in some ways and facilitation in others is going to expedite that healing process and get you better that much mm -hmm. quicker. So, yeah, you know, it reminds me of a, a statement I make to all my ankle clients, particularly is that. I say one of the biggest mistakes that we will make in your care or you will decide in your care is not to finish this off with the rehab to 100%. A lot of people feel pretty darn good at 85, 90%. And then they wonder why a couple months later they've sprained that thing again. So it's a dialogue I have with my clients and I finish it up with one of the greatest things in turn that I can do for you is to make sure that we rehab this thing to 100%. And a lot of the things, including ACL rehab and ankle sprains uh, and things like patellar tendonitis, a lot of the uh, extensor mechanism loading type things, is I make sure that I do a, a hop test. You know, have you equalized uh, a single leg broad jump hop on your good side? Can you make it the same distance on the other side? Stick the landing, show good proprioception, you know, and then can you do, I do the 10 step. Uh, a 10 hop test, you know, 10 quick long hopping tests on your good side, 10 long quick hops on your uh, affected or old injured side. And um, until those things feel equal, you're not done with your rehab. That side is not the same. 
And as we know, most sports, it's running and hopping and jumping and moving quickly and float phase mechanics where you're literally leaping off that one leg onto the other one. And if that thing is not um, equal to the other side and you've hopped off your good leg and going to land on that other one, if you haven't rehabbed that, you're just asking for another injury. God forbid something higher up the chain like an ACL or a MCL or a meniscus or something like that. So, you know, I've been using that hop protocol for a long, long time, you know, the better part of 20 years because it's what we were doing when I was in my residency. And uh, we used that back then, you know, 97, 1997, the single leg broad jump um, for the uh, terminal checking for ACL rehab. You've done everything else. Can you now launch off of it and load onto it with good proprioception, keeping the knee in the sagittal plane, no wobble through the foot? You know, is there collapsing through the hip? Are you drifting into, you know, pelvic drift and stuff like that? So, you know, if you're not doing that kind of stuff, folks, it might be something very worthy. And uh, you take anybody, whether they've got hip, knee, or ankle problems, and you do that hop test on your first initial uh, examination with your clients, uh, you're going to get an eyebrow raised from your client going, wow, this is actually more unstable than I thought. And people tend to forget that because we're always on the good leg and then on the bad leg. And then very shortly after that, you're back on the good leg again. And we don't tend to notice that because we're not constantly on the bad leg. And so uh, I was just on a, a phone call with a lady who came to see me. She's a, I think we've mentioned her before here. She's a a marathoner from Tasmania and she lives between there and, and Australia. She came over and she's a very talented um, a vet veterinarian. She works with horses and she was over at the Kentucky Derby last year and she came up to see me from Kentucky uh, up here into Illinois and uh, we saw her and we, we, we were making some corrections and it's kind of hard to do it because I've only seen her once but we've over the past year we've been making some adaptations to her gate of based off of you know my my examination and all of the notes that i took trying to as best i can in one single examination which is kind of hard because you know when you examine someone on their first visit you're kind of seeing how their function is based off of their current dysfunctional patterns and then you start them into rehab and exercises and you start peeling back those bad patterns and changing the patterns and i've told her this you know several times you know I'm probably making recommendations based on an entirely different system than what we saw back then, but we'll do the best that we can. It's why we don't take a lot of uh, cases over the internet without even an initial exam because there's a lot of guesswork there. And it's why you need follow-up exams because if you're doing the right work, your patient's changing, so your rehab should change. You know, gone are the days of here's your homework, just keep doing it and everything is good. So um, everybody's a little bit smarter than that right now, but um, I don't know why I went down that rabbit hole. Anyways. Um, finishing your rehab is important and, um, you know, oh, we were, we just were, I was just on the phone with her on Wednesday morning and, um, had her go through some hop transitions and she's like, yeah, that right leg, uh, or the left leg still isn't uh, up to par. And I said, so we're not done yet. You need to keep working, you know? So, uh, very interesting. She's still having a little po tib posterior problem on that side and, and, uh, or just, she's having poor loading response and hopping and she's, she's hopping for 26 miles. So, um, you know, the load's going somewhere. In her case, it's going down into that foot and collapsing the arch and straining the tip posterior a little bit. So still some work to be done, but uh, don't forget about the hopping challenges, folks. It's really important. So um, let's talk about that tweet that I mentioned uh, from Jill Cook and a couple of the other very uh, prominent and, and wise PTs from around the world. You know, they were talking about isometrics, and they actually quoted this British, is it the British? British, um, British Journal of Sports yeah, Medicine BMJ. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, isometric exercise induces analgesia and reduces inhibition in, in patellar tendinopathy. Um, they didn't go into the article too much when they were tweeting, but they were trying to discern, um, and we'll talk about the article in a moment, but what is the time frame between isometrics you know, how long does it take you to recover from an isometric challenge? You know, a lot of the times, and we've talked about this in recent podcasts about loading an isometric, building up to two minutes and doing that every hour for a tendinopathy. And let's just talk about an Achilles tendinopathy or patellar tendinopathy here. Load it in a painful position, uh, load it frequently, load it often, and load it as much as you can to tolerance without pain. And then, of course, after that, you add some dynamic ranges and dynamic loading. But, um, yeah, I guess the question, it seemed like the question was, how often can I do this in my office and how long do I need to recover between client sets before they can load it again? And uh, Jill Cook responded back that, um, what'd she say? 
It depends what you're trying to achieve. Long rest for cortical recovery should be about two minutes and less rest at one minute partial recovery for muscle strength. And uh, I figured that might be something that you could even comment on because you've mentioned uh, 150 milliseconds and or was it microseconds? Um, go ahead and take the mic here, bud. Well, you know, recovery times, we've got the standard, uh, you know, information, which is going to travel from the peripheral receptor up to the cortex. And then depending upon which system um, we've got the information going in, it'll get bounced around. And then we have this interpolation that's going to occur. And then it's going to come down and synapse in a number of different areas, potentially the anterior motor neuronal pool, which is, you know, in this, this case, um, causing muscle contraction, or you know any number of other areas, from reticular formation, basal ganglia, cerebellum, um, etc. So cortical fatigue is where kind of the brain is having trouble processing, you know, all of the information as it's coming down. Whereas peripheral fatigue is more of a muscular local phenomena within the muscle itself. In other words, you're going to be limited by, one, the availability of ATP, two, you know, the efficiency of the sodium potassium pump, three, your ability to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you know, and is the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the terminal cisterns, are they uh, patent? In other words, have they been injured and we've got calcium leaking out all over or are they relatively intact? Um, when we have different types of contractions and... Um, the, the original study that we were talking about initially here um, out of the British Journal of Sports Medicine actually looks at pain analgesia or exercise-induced analgesia in people with patellar tendinopathy. And that kind of went off into the, well, isometrics versus isotonics, you know, why. And in this particular study, what they did, and it was a small study, six volleyball players with patellar tendinitis participated in the study. And what they found is that when people did isometric contractions, what it did is it um, reduced pain during a squat activity, okay, um, significantly. Um, and it only occurred with isometrics. It didn't occur with isotonics, um, which is kind of interesting because the literature kind of doesn't really separate out isometric versus isotonic. So isometric, isotonic, isokinetic, all of those show pain inhibition are going to occur through a number of different mechanisms. You know, is it local? Is it cortical? More than likely, it's cortical. And we have, and we've talked about this before, we've got like the descending um, cortical pathways, and you've got a dopaminergic pathway, a serotonergic pathway, you've got an, um, a cholinergic pathway. So there's a, there's a number of different ones which can come down, plus we've got the um, alpha-7 nicotinic pathway, which is more of a peripheral one. And all of those things can help to induce analgesia. So what I, you know, tried to do, um, and I haven't had a lot of time to delve into it super deeply, was just, well, what's the mechanism? You know, like, why was it only the isometrics that they got this diminished analgesic effect? And it didn't occur with isotonics. You know, isometrics classically um, cause a physiological overflow of strength when you're doing the exercise to about 10 degrees on each side of the point of application, whereas... Uh, isotonics are about 15 degrees, and isotonics are usually somewhat more physiological. You know, you're picking something up and bringing it from point A to point B, so it weighs, you know, 20 pounds and you pick it up, it weighs 20 pounds as you carry it, and it weighs 20 pounds when you put it down. That's more of an isotonic exercise, whereas we think of isometrics as more maybe postural, or, you know, your head is forward for a long period of time and you're experiencing discomfort, um, that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's that's what the study was about originally, um, looking at that. And you, you know, your times are going to change. One of the things that they found in this particular study was that isometric contractions um, released cortical um, inhibition to a pretty good, big um, difference. So we're looking at uh, 27% to 54%. Um, in other words, that cortical inhibition the cortical spinal ex excitativity, the cortical spinal tracts is what's going to ultimately drive those muscles. Um, so what is it that's actually causing that? And that, that really is the million dollar question. You know, is it, again, is it local? And, and then why in this particular study, and there's a couple others as well. I did a, a quick um, lit search looking at it. And there's a few other studies too that supported um, the use of isometrics. But this is the only one that I've seen that compares isometrics to um, isotonics. 
Um, and, and this is a single bout. This is a single resistance training bout. Um, and then people had, you know, diminished pain for 45 minutes after, which is, you know, fairly significant um, as far as that goes. And the good news is it's real easy for people to do, you know, isometrics at home. Um, they can do that there. So anyway, um, people that have particular patellar tendonitis in this study, but other pain syndromes, isometrics might be a better thing. You, you get better fiber recruitment with isometrics. You know, it's going to generate the largest amount of tension in a tendon. And maybe that's right. why they're used so much for tendon rehab, um, as opposed to an isotonic or an isokinetic, which isokinetics are just a artificially, you know, cybex, that kind of stuff, biodex. Um, so we don't really have things isokinetic in our world. You know, they're isometric or they're isotonic. But um, it's, you know, it's it's interesting. And I always, you know, would find exercise a lot of times would induce um, analgesia, but a lot of times that's aerobic. And those mechanisms, you know, with because of, you know, endogenous opioid release and things like that are pretty well established, you know, as far as like we have a fairly good idea that like this is what's going on. Um, but with the with these exercises, we don't we don't see you know, as much going on in there. And it's interesting because up until you sent me these papers, I didn't know who these people were. So, um, and maybe that's because lately I've been reading about a lot of other stuff other than um, isometric exercises, but um, interesting stuff. And um, if you have a chance to look at the uh, the Rio paper, um, it is a free full text. And um, I'm sure you'll put that in the show notes. Um, but it's nice because you can read through the whole thing and, and read about what they did and look at the references. Well, one of the reasons why Jill Cook and all these folks are, are making you know such a, such noise, a positive noise, is that with an isometric, you can find a pain-free position to load a painful, damaged, inflamed, partially torn, whatever, tendon. So if you're moving through the range, you're going to have part of that arc of movement being painful. This way, you can choose a range and load it. So if you've got a 15-degree or 30-degree arc of pain, you can load just outside of that on either end, and you taught me that, and you get spillover on either side. So if you've got pain from 45 degrees to 90 degrees, you could start at 44 degrees and then work at 91 degrees, and you'll get a 10 to 15 degree spillover on either side. So you get a very small slice of that painful arc that's um, getting some load and maybe teach that tendon how to load again. So that's one of the advantages, and it's... Um, you know, runners know this. A lot of athletes know this. You know, when I have a lot of pain, a lot of stiffness, but, you know, within a mile into my run, I feel pretty good. Well, there we go. There's the analgesic study, and there's part of, you know, the loading response that you start facilitating the tendon, but you start getting this analgesic. It's one of the reasons why I tell my folks, you need to load this thing, and you need to load it often in a pain-free position and progress the loading, but you need to follow the rules. It can't be painful. And you need to experiment with the loading range each time you do it, but making sure you don't go into pain. And if you did that every hour, you know, according to this study, and you got a 45-minute, you know, period of analgesia, you might only have pain for 15 minutes. You know, maybe you should do it every 44 minutes then. You know, if one could even make that, uh, you know, that, that silly statement that, well, maybe we can completely, you know, obliterate the pain cycle by just making sure that we load this thing every 40 or so minutes. So, you know, I tell folks that if we did it every hour, uh, it's not realistic, but in a perfect world, if you did, you might get, you know, a few minutes of, of change in that tendon. And each time you did it, you might get a few more seconds and a few more seconds. After a week, you might be getting 15, 20 minutes of better loading. And so now you only have to figure out how to close that gap 40 minutes or so or 30 minutes between the next time it gets loaded again. So it's why it's so it's such a nice way to get around these tendon problems because you can load it pain free and you can slowly sneak in loading responses without ever having the patient entertain pain anymore. So it's something that I use a lot. It's something that you should use a lot to the listeners. And, um, I start experimenting with it. You know, I've, I've used it at, with the knee patellar, you know, I've I recently just started working with a, uh, an ex pro, uh, a basketball player and has had both knees operated on has got all kinds of patellar problems patellar uh, tendon problems and this is like magic to him he's like god i wish we knew this kind of stuff when i was playing and um so you know whatever gluteal tendinopathy it's another big one that i see a lot of my runners because they don't have a lot of that pelvic hip stability during the loading phase of of their little running hops if you will like we talked about earlier and so the gluteal tendon gets this uh unfair loading response so put them into the position have them loaded up 
and uh you know the good part is a lot of patients don't have to stop running then they can just keep working on this and you know if there's ever a group of people that need to run for many reasons from psychological to calorie caloric to everything else uh, let alone you know having a goal of a marathon around the corner these folks don't want to stop running so you've got to find ways to get them to load and teach them how to do it often so that they can keep running you know the question always is can i get enough loading in to offset the pathology but um, you know that's kind of the that's where the magic lies is, you know, how fast can you make that change and teach them that loading response. So, yeah. The other thing we should emphasize, too, is just that it's not complete analgesia. You know, it's a significant decrease. Like in this study, you know, VAS or pain scores went down from 6.8 to 2.6. Yeah, it's not a magic um, bullet. To, to so it's it. not magic, but it, it definitely, it's working. You know, you're getting a, a fairly significant reduction. Um, in discomfort. So that's just something else to kind of keep in the back of your mind as well. And, you know, if you're combining that with, you know, better nutrition, better loading, different cognitive stimulation, um, all these other things, um, you know, it all of a sudden becomes a whole lot, a whole lot less because remember pain is an emotional response to adequate activation of the nociceptive afferent system. So in other words, it's an emotional response. We feel pain in our cingulate gyrus. It's not like we do this much tissue damage and you feel this much pain, it's going to be different depending upon each individual and what the state of their nervous system is. So it could be very different. You know, people that are very strong responders, a lot of times very small stimulus is going to create discomfort, whereas people are um, weak responders, it may take a whole lot more um, to get around that. Uh, Yeah, and that brings up another great point. It's why... um... You know, you get different pain responses on different days depending on if if you haven't slept and, you know, you're nursing a hangover and some poor nutrition that day and, you know, your wife is cranky, your husband's cranky, you know, your boss is cranky, you're cranky. I mean, you know, you're likely going to have a bad or worse day with pain on that day. I mean, a lot of this, like you said, it's between the ears. So the tissue damage is down there, but the representation is between the, you know, the ears. Yeah. You put up a a cool... Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to jump on, but let's keep talking. No, I was just going to say that um, last week we did our online CE class where we basically looked at a whole bunch of different cases. It was like way too many cases for an hour. I think we did 12. Um, But it was really neat. And you had put up a post um, talking about um, um, gait being all-encompassing and how that you know, is going to affect things. So did you want to talk about that a little bit or? Well, we've gone into it, you know, many times. This was just another flavor of, of, of a common topic that we have certainly, uh, you know, beaten to death. But, um, you know, this one is, is certainly, this was done, uh, you know, what, what was it, the 24th or so of September, 25th, somewhere around there, I think. Um, you know, it's just talking about... Um, it, they had talked about in that article and I put it up because we didn't mention it in the actual presentation so I wanted to include it and it's on the slide that we put up on social media but they, they here they were talking about steady state cortical neuron discharge and non-steady state uh, a cortical neuron discharge and they were talking about um, you know what, what does that mean and you know the interpretation from the article is that you know let's imagine you're on a long country road and there's no cars there's no bikes there's no you know lions hunting you down there's no sticks there's nothing on the road there's no dips it's just as boring and flat a run as it is and your brain starts to wander you're not probably not going to have too many distractions so you get into this kind of steady state cortical motor neuron firing uh, it's a lot of um, involuntary um, uh, motor patterning And, um, you know, the sensory information is fairly bland, but uh, take that now to doing some hill runs and where there's rocks and tree roots and you're going uphill and downhill and there's tree branches you got to duck underneath and uh, maybe your dog's running with you and you got to make sure you don't trip over your dog. And, uh, you know, you change over to this non-steady state cortical uh, response and, you know, this is all prefrontal cortex type, you know, pre-calculation stuff, but you know, that's kind of the gist of the article was talking that there's a lot of these pre-calculations that we do and you move into these volitional type 
um, behaviors. Like, for example, let's say you're running a, an obstacle course or a, a steeplechase or something. You've got these hurdles that you have to go over and things you've got to duck underneath or a Spartan race where you've got all these challenges that you have to go through. And so all of a sudden you're using a different postural system. And, you know, the, the presentation that we, we, were, we gave in, in the slide that you're referring to, we were talking about arm swing and limb um, movements and we even brought up the Paul Hodges study out of Australia from back in the, I think the 90s there on, you know, the transverse abdominus firing pr uh, prior to limb movement, you know, where, you know, in essence, you're firing the core muscles before limb movement to there's this pre-calculation of load. And so we were talking about postural stability and that you have to have appropriate postural stability in order to have limb mobility that's not compromised and not uh, um, faulty patterning. So that was kind of the gist of the article, but you know, it, for me, it really came down to how I summarized it on that blog post or on that you know blog post page on on social media as well as I uh, will transfer it over to our website. Was that um, you know, and as I said here, make no mistake, bad, faulty, inefficient mo motor patterns can become automated if injuries are left. Just like we were talking about with the ankle sprains, if you leave something, the system has to adapt with what you've left if it's not a clean pattern. Um, so you've got to finish rehabbing these things. And so, you know, this takes us right back to that whole asymmetry debate that was going on a month or two ago where people thought, you know, Usain Bolt's got this asymmetry and uh, look at the power he's outputting and he's the fastest man in the world. You know, and, and we brought up the point, well, what if he was symmetrical? Could he be faster? And, and, you know, that's what started the debate of, well, asymmetry is the norm, so you guys can't have that debate. And, you know, our answer was, well, sure we can have that debate. And what if it's not the case and then of course so Usain Bolt turns around and has two injuries I think within a week's time and loses two races and you know and so it was one of those hmm raise an eyebrow maybe those guys are right but maybe we're not you know it was just a debate that I thought was worthy of having but you know as I always say if asymmetry is the norm just don't be the person creating more of it for your client by adding more strength skill and endurance um, on their faulty patterns, you know, taking someone who still has a little residual left from an injury, you can't see it because you're not really f flossing it out with detailed stuff like the hop test or whatnot, and then you start adding more loading and more endurance on them, and everything seems fine, but little do you know you're driving a little bit more asymmetry into the system that they might not have had prior to that injury. And maybe there wasn't even an injury, but you're just taking your client and everything looks good. There's some asymmetries, but you assume that that's the norm and you go ahead and strengthen them. And now you just make them a little bit more durable on that asymmetry. Are you welcoming an injury because you're actually raising the whole threshold or power output or, um, you know, force output of their system? Are they more vulnerable? That's the question. The hard part is, is that people can have this debate all they want. But no one really knows because we don't have this person cloned and you can't do that study side by side. But I'm going to stand true that I think if you can reduce asymmetries on people and build more strength, skill, and endurance on that symmetrical pattern, they're probably going to be a little less prone for injury and maybe a better athlete. And that was kind of our whole debate with Usain Bolt and that whole asymmetry problem with that one one article that everybody was you know going to town on considering it the gold standard which was a mistake in my opinion because we now have the article and it doesn't quite say what people thought it said but um so that was kind of you know my stance on that but i would love to hear what you have to say on that uh whether it's agreeable or inagreeable or disagreeable you know i think you summarized it um really well it is global and all-encompassing and if people are upright in the gravitational plane walking etc um you need to take that into consideration and you really need to be incorporating gate rehab um into everything that you're doing um in addition to that like looking at these asymmetries and then you know asymmetries are the norm like you said and we have to accept that and then help the patient or the client to best be able to work around that you know they're, they're there to see you for a, largely a reason sometimes it's performance enhancement but usually because of an injury pain uh, inhibition disability etc so your ability to tease that out and help them to basically be better compensators because that's what i tell my patients i don't get anybody better i just make you a better compensator um, for what you've got going on um is important and um hopefully people will go back and look at um, that presentation, those that couldn't be there. We had a huge group um, that were on the call, but those people that couldn't do it will go back and actually check that out. And we gave a lot of snapshots of different scenarios and cases. 
and then like gave snippets talking about, well, is it this? Is it this? Is it this? You know, these are all things you should be checking, you know? Mm -hmm. And we did that with, you know, like leaning and increased thigh flexion and all of these other typical things that we see in uh, gait evaluation and gait scenarios um, in a clinical setting. And it wasn't that we provided as many answers as that we hopefully opened up folks' minds to more questions that they should be asking. Yeah, the presentation was on the foot and how the core and the upper, you know, torso adapts to faulty foot patterns, uh, foot pathologies and neurologic pathologies down in the lower part and how the upper body has to make an adaptive change, which we know it does. I mean, you still have to keep moving. You still have to stay posturally upright. So that one is actually up on onlinece.com. That's onlinece.com. It's Biomechanics 202. And um, we reviewed it this week and gave them the okay. So it should be up. If it's not going to be up, it probably will be up, you know, by the weekend or early next week. So by the time you guys hear this podcast, it should be up. So by Biomechanics 202 on online CE or chirocredit.com. So um, it's a fairly in-depth presentation, but there's a lot of videos. And, um, but uh, it's one that we will probably refine as we go along. You know, and maybe to finish that conversation, you know, it, it was a little frustrating of a week for me in that uh, um, a colleague of mine out in the uh, the training world, a, a very um, educated and, and very um, open-minded trainer, sent me some photo or uh, video of this um, very young uh, uh, but talented sprinter. And he said, man, he's the fastest guy that I've worked with. And it showed that he just had all kinds of external limb torsion. The knee wasn't in the sagittal plane. The feet were turned out. He was clearly crossing over. And um, there was a lot of vertical up and down gait. So, you know, the, there was a lot of things that we're very familiar with. And the listeners who have been here with us on the pod or on the blog for a long time know a lot of those things are faulty movement patterns that should be corrected. And I said, you need to send this guy in here. This is really complicated. Uh, and I need to help you define how to unlayer this or at least the first stage. And he said, well, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the season. So I'll send you send him over to you at the end of the season. And, and I'm like... You know, I text him back, okay, and I really wanted to say, okay, yeah, get him good and strong in this pattern. Add a couple more layers of strength and endurance to this so that I have a more of a, a challenge to it. But, you know, it's one of those, the quicker you get to this thing and the quicker you start training it out. Now I get that maybe they're in the middle of the season. In fact, I know that they are, and, um, you know, you don't want to be breaking down patterns that are working that don't seem to be injurious at this time. But, you know, one of those things is he, well, he could get injured because of this pattern and what if we just tapped into a little bit of this and made him a little bit more efficient and more economical and reduced a little bit of his liability? He might actually run faster this season. You know, the nice part about getting these teenagers is that it doesn't take them that long because their pattern hasn't been that long on it. But uh, as I always say, it's very sad to see that we, we're not given this playbook on how to do things. We just go out and we run. And, um, you know, it's our God-given right to run. Um, and... You know, I, I always kind of snicker at the people that say, oh, you know, you know, Peshaw to the, you know, gait, you know, analysis and, and form changes and gait changes and running form correction, just go and run. And I'm like, wow, that to me in, you know, and maybe I'm just an idiot, but I think that's just really a, a sloppy statement that, um, you know, we see plenty of people that have very bad mechanics that could be more economical and more power, uh, more force, more protection, more efficient with just a few little changes in their gait. But, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to make the statement that client's not injured and they're a good athlete and just let them run. You don't need to make any adaptive changes here. Well, it's an easy statement to make. And you're right until you're not right, until that person's injured, until they're not the fastest person. Uh, and unfortunately, we get a lot of these people, and I know you do too, and you make these changes, and they're running faster, and they're angry. You know, why wasn't this change made before, and why didn't anybody else pick this up? And, you know, I've been noticing that my feet are too turned out or too turned in, and I can't get to my glutes or whatever. Why didn't anybody else make these changes? And, you know, they just kept making me stronger, and more workouts, and, you know, it, it just, it's a shame, I think, but... Um, you know, maybe, maybe they're not where we are. And I certainly, uh, 10 years ago, I'm not where I am right now. And I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes back then and poor choices. So it's hard to make a judgment call, but, um, just saying go and run and everything's fine. That's your natural gait and uh, don't let anybody change it is, is kind of a, it's an easy statement to make. So it's silly. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I was being nice. <laughs> I had some other words <laughs> I would probably use for it, but <laughs> silly works. <laughs> yes, I know. But uh, you know, I was uh, probably one of those people fifteen years ago or twenty years ago when I started out into practice. Everything's fine, you know. You you work off your current level of knowledge and wisdom, and you know, and it's pretty thin, and your background isn't in exactly gate, you know, form changes. But all you know is what you've read on the internet with a very limited base of experience. It's easy to make some assumptions and. Um, and you know you read what you you know what you read and you you know what you know and um hopefully that well deepens a little bit and you make some choices and you 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 know you, you listen to some people you read some other things and then do some of your own work and realize you know that doesn't make sense we can we can do better than this and um you know i'm still learning i learned a couple new things this week that were you know i had to stop in the middle of a patient visit and just write a couple things down i said you just taught me something and something just became an epiphany for me and I need to just take a moment and write it down and patients like tell me what did you learn and I'm like well, okay well you know we'll spend some time at the end talking about this a little bit so uh, patients get kind of geeked out when they realize the person they're coming to see actually just uh, learned something off of them so it's called practice for a reason right that's it yeah. what do you want to finish up on the baby's brain or are we we got a, we I got think we're time. good at this point. We yeah. can okay. open with that or make a nice opening for the neuroscience piece next time. So, Yeah, because someone on social media brought up, you know, that baby's brain one that you were talking about, and they brought up multitasking to try and challenge the thought process. And I think I know what your response would be, but we will go into that next time because that's a that's worthy I left a of, response, of, too. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very worthy discussion. So we'll go into that next time. So um, that's it, folks. Thanks for joining us. We know your time is valuable. We hope that uh, having us in your ears was helpful to you. I think I would like to say finish off with uh, go listen to some Joe Satriani or some uh, Dream Theater and make your day complete, right? You know, so, that's a great way to start and end the day. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to think I gave Ivo one of his greatest birthday gifts ever or Christmas gifts ever. I sent him a, a, a some Dream Theater uh, sw- swag last uh, year and... Uh, Hopefully that's getting some good use. So, and I wear I wear my sweatshirt, my zip up uh, almost every day. So yes, it gets <laughs> lots of use. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, you go and enjoy your concert, and uh, let me know how the uh, the boy what he thinks of it. Uh, we are I'm sure we are all at the edge of our seat. We want to hear how that concert yes, was. So yes, yes, we'll, I'm we'll, sure. Yes. <laughs> we'll tune, yeah, at least at least some of us nerds, right? I know there are some listeners out there that really do get what we're talking about. So, um, anyways, Sean Allen in Chicago. I have a whirl up deal in Colorado. We will see you in the shoe aisle.